That's a strong coffee. <laughs> People literally can't separate it. Mr. Wong will not be very happy with me. I'm seeing things that don't exist. Honestly, I twitch at night thinking about this place. <sighs> Makes you high. Breaking multiple health and safety. Eh? Cut the shrimps on a barbie. Is my lack of extreme enthusiasm coming through? It is a beautiful structure, it's stunning. It's good, a one mil cable being fed off 16. Everybody, it's another day. There's fluffy clouds, there's bird song but the bucket truck has a flat battery. <laughs> it's flat battery season, I don't understand. I think I know what it is. Because this van gets parked in here over the weekends, every time you open this door, it brings on all the interior lights, but it also brings up all the dashboard lights and everything. And of course, when you keep doing that, I think it just flattens the battery. It wasn't totally flat, but it was like, you could just tell it was really low. So I've got it on a little trickle charger, only my little motorcycle charger, a little trickle charger. I need to buy a fat charger. So you know when we were in Sortimo and I was telling you about those Anderson connectors which they have behind the grill? I've just ordered some on, online on my tough book. I'll put an Anderson connector here so you can just literally click in and you can just charge up. And I've got one of those garage workshop, you know, the 200 amp workshop chargers. So I'll just leave that here and you can just click in over the weekend. So, but this is a van that's just had a new, it literally has just had a new battery fitted about a week ago. Naomi's van had the same issue, funnily enough, which is the other van at the back of the shop. And James was driving along the other day, and as he was driving along, suddenly, he just had the new battery fitted, driving along, and it said um, power steering fault, and then a second later, braking system fault, and the dashboard just lights up like a Las Vegas slot machine. And he pulled in, I was like, what do I do? And I was like, look, just wait there, and we'll call the RAC. RAC came out, they were like, oh, you can't see anything wrong, we'll re reset it, see how you get on. So he drove home, he rung me up Saturday morning. He was like, oh, I was driving around, it's just done it again. I was like, oh, frog snacks. So they come out again. Oh, I've reset it, can't see anything wrong really. <laughs> Came in here this morning, I swear to God. He said, oh, it's just, it's done it again on the motorway coming in. It just comes up saying braking system, fault, airbag, fault. It just, it, the last, the dashboard just lights up like a Christmas tree. So I was like, just leave it here, take the, take the Kangoo and I'll have a look. I swear to God, I've just come out. And I'm like, there can't be, a, there cannot be anything wrong with this van. There can't be sensors faulty or anything. All that was wrong with it was the positive clamp on the terminal there was loose. That's all it was. It was nothing more than that. I literally took a 10 mil spanner, tightened it up, jobs are good. And in fact, I was so angry when I saw it, I sent a video on WhatsApp to Sarah. In fact, I'll leave the, I'll play the video on the screen now. Honestly, Sarah, this is what I'm on about with people, in people, honestly. It's this two year old van and a brand new battery. You can't just have issues like this. Just taking the cover off. The battery terminal's loose, that's all that's causing it. These idiots. So yeah, I literally just, uh, I got a spanner, tightened it up, good as gold. And I think all that was happening, whenever you, you, cause the power steering's electric, it's not like a belt driven pump on these things. Everything's electric. And I think as soon as you drove over a pothole or something, you're just vibrating that terminal and it just, it just sends the computer into a tizzy fit. And that's the thing, people moan at me like, oh, you're servicing your own vehicles, pot kettle black, you tell people not to do their own electrical work and you service your own vans. Yeah, I do for this exact reason. Three fully qualified mechanics. You know, all right, there are AC mechanics, but they don't make any difference. They're fully qualified mechanics. Their fucking battery terminals loose, you know? These are, these are people who are like doing should be able to tear an engine down and rebuild it, you know what I'm saying? That's why I service my own vehicles, you know? Because you can just take your time and get it right. Right, we're in zone B, whatever part of London that's in. I actually can't remember. Sarah booked this in, it's an EICR. This has come up in conversation before about parking tickets, like, and this is the classic example. This whole road here, W, uh, it's Chiswick, I think, Ealing, Chiswick neck of the woods. Unless you live here and you have a permit to park here, there's no on-street parking. So basically, unless the customer can go online and give you an electronic permit for an hour or two hours, you're basically gonna get a parking ticket. And there were some people that were saying, oh, it's really immoral to bill it back to the customer. And a couple of people, there's a bit of noise about that, why? At the end of the day, it's, you know, the customer has to provide you the ability to park. And if you can't park, or if you can park, but if you get a ticket, you just bill it to the customer. Why should that 85 pound come out of my wage? It's the customer's responsibility at the end of the day. Why should I, and not being funny, some people are charging 80 pound for the EICRs. <laughs> I'm not gonna make any money, you know? So yeah, I mean, we'll, I'll ask the customer if they've got a permit to park here, but if they haven't, you just get a ticket and then you bill it back to the client. But I, I, as far as I'm aware, that's very standard practice. That's not, you know, you're not profiteering. You're just covering your expenses like your any other expense you would have, you know? 
Right, now, today's job number is, there is no job number, because it's not been put in the system. Right, so EICR. We're actually on the tail end of the EICRs that we're doing now. We've got like, I think 10, 12 more to do, and that's our bank of them. I mean, unless other ones come in, but that's our bank of them done. And this is one we're doing today. I quoted it as a four-way board. And this is one of the issues that you get. We quote by board and circuit, and I've said this a couple of times before, so it's like £80 a board, and then £25 for every circuit in the board. Well, I quoted this as four circuits, because it was, right? But when you take the cover off, there's like eight circuits that have been crammed into a four-way board. So, yeah, you've got, a third, you've got two 32s and two 16s. So the lights are being fed off a 16 amp by the looks of it. It's good, a one mil cable being fed off a 16. We've got a ring and a rated on a 32 and two rings on a 32. We've got some 10 mil sinks and single insulated meter tails. Not very pretty, but the customer has made us coffee. Oh, that's, um, that's a strong coffee. <laughs> oh. Mm. Oh, that'll, uh, that'll put hairs on my chest. These boards. They're such shit to work on. They're just garbage. They're not garbage. The problem is you get you get this problem here where people overload the fuse board with just way more circuits than they're designed to accommodate. And like I've turned the main switch off here because I'm just not comfortable. These are such short little boards, such small little boards, sorry. But I mean, like you've got the tails there are still live. And like you're dicking around here trying to pull these cables out. And it's so close. It's just, I really don't like doing it. It's horrible. But it's only so safe you can work, you know. At the end of the day, you've still got a job to get on with. So in circuit one, we've got one ring and three radials by the, uh, one ring and two radials by the looks of it. Okay, circuit one, broken neutral. That's a good start. You see, this is the problem you come across. And like, I'm not sure, I had four cables in, a, in the top of a 32 amp breaker, right? And one of them is a ring. The one's, it's a ring, but we've got a broken neutral, but it is, it's a ring. So the neutral's broken, but we know we've got a ring. The other two were also in that breaker, these two here. Is that just two radials or was that a ring that has just been split? And I'm not, I don't know because there's a break on the live, but there's a break on the neutral as well. And I, what I'm trying to work out, is that actually just two radials, like one disappears off somewhere, another one disappears off, or is it actually a ring? And, you know, Bob the Builder's been in and split the ring or something, and you, you don't know, that's, you know, you just don't know. The way it's been installed, you would think it was a ring that's been split, would be my, would be my guess. You've got an aluminium core there for one of the sockets, you know, and then you've got copper. Now that's one ring, but this ring is the same age cabling and it looks like it comes through the same hole. It looks like it's been installed at the same time. So my hunch would probably be it's a ring that's got a break in it. And that's what I'm gonna put down. Right, we just finished that job. So it needs a new fuse board. I mean, that's shot. There's no way of getting around that. So it needs like a 12 way board fitting, but it got me wondering, like I couldn't remove any of the down lights in that property. And it does make you wonder some of them are easy enough to remove, but these ones have really tough springs. And when you pull it out, the problem is it damages the plaster. And you can't go damaging the customer's property just to do a test. So you just put it down as a limitation. I just put on the ticket, operational limitations. You just put it down as uh, unable to remove down lights because of damage to the ceiling. But of course, under your R1, R2 and your ZS, you just put lim. What else do you put? When you go back to fit the new fuse board, if there's a, an issue or something, or let's say you've got, you have to pull a downlight out to run a bit of cable in or something. And when you say to the customer, look, these downlights are a bit ropey. You need, we really need to change these because they haven't been terminated correctly because they'll almost certainly have single insulated conductors on show. I don't think I've ever come across a house which has been perfectly done. And they just think you're robbing them when you say, ah, oh, you've got to, you're going to have to spend a bit more now because you've got to get these downlights, you know, you've got to cut these and re-terminate them. And they just think you're robbing them, but you're not. That's just the nature of EICR testing, but you can't, you know. I, they're relatively new downlights in that flat, and I don't think, I don't think there'll be a problem. I mean, they've been, they've been corked in. Someone's gone around it with a cork gun, so I don't really want to have to start taking them out. But I did insulation test it, and there was only 2.1 mega ohms. It was low, but it's still... It should be okay, it's passable. So leave your thoughts below how you deal with that sort of stuff. You know, when you go to do a, a fuse board upgrade and stuff and like new stuff comes out of the woodwork. I think you just have to politely explain it to the customer. Look, I mean, you know, that's just the nature of the beast, but leave your thoughts below. Right, everybody, um, that EICR is done. So I've got the steamer courtesy of GoBob. So I'm gonna give these vans a little steam off now quickly before, cause it's just gone four o'clock. 
so everyone else is just about to leave so i'm going to give these a clean off but do you remember in a piece of content we did i think it was last week or the week before and we were talking about hiring apprentices because we're trying to take on new apprentices i totally get why there are so many apprentices out there who can't find work placements i totally understand it now and i can't say the name of colleges or you know placement placements or i can't say the name of any of them because i'll just end up with a legal claim for libel against me so i can't say anything but what i can say is i totally get it because the colleges just don't they i can't express enough how little they care they just all it's about is just getting apprentices with an employer whether they they, don't, they could not care less whether they you know they, they don't look oh does it does that does that person match that company no i don't know let's try and find couldn't care and all of that don't they don't give a toss about it's just about getting an apprentice with a company that's it because once as soon as they've done that they get their government grant so or something along those lines but it's just been the most it's just absurd i've never struggled so i, I totally get it why smes don't want to take on apprentices i get it that charity we worked for just over there plius i think they were called they take on kids who are they've been cautioned by police and they're not they're at risk of they're at they're called an at risk sector at risk of going into crime um, and i thought that was actually a really good idea take on you know take on an apprentice like that somebody who's at risk and i thought what a nice thing to do you know, to try and take on a young person and just try and straighten them out a little bit you know so i think we may be looking at doing that i'm not sure yet but maybe we'll do that but the, through the modern traditional route it's a waste of time utter waste of time this is not a particularly good microfiber cloth, so I think Mr. Wong will not be very happy with me. When George said he was going to, because he gave me one of these, we didn't pay for it. But, and I was, I was a bit thing about it. I was like, are we actually really ever going to use it? And I was like a bit apprehensive. I was like, all right, fair enough. But I've got to be honest, I've got to be honest I wouldn't be without it now. Every single person who's come in here and used it has all said, it is awesome. And just let me demonstrate the ease of how fast you can, I mean, you wash something, you basically use steam to clean a vehicle. But you don't even really have to wipe it if you didn't want to. You could just use this to clean it. But it is that effortless. And that's it. You just move on to the next bit of bodywork. I mean, it really, it's just, you just wipe, 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 that's it. And you just keep going. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really good. It's great for cleaning like all this stuff, all the stuff where just, you know, crap builds up and stuff it is fantastic for cleaning stuff like super clean i was doing my bike with it the other day so yeah big thank you mr wong because uh, it is appreciated it's uh, it's been used here every single week without fail right while i'm out cleaning the van uh because it's home time now everyone else has gone home i thought we would just do a quick a quick q a uh just replying to some of your comments just try and stay in touch with you guys and try and make a real effort to stay in touch so we'll do a quick q a now there were a few people talking about the um, foldable cones, traffic cones. I know the ones you mean, and I've seen them. Apparently they are Chapter 8 compliant, but I've never used them. And they looked, they just looked a bit chintzy and a bit, they don't look like they'd stand up to like everyday use. Maybe I'll try a couple. I'll buy, I'll buy some and I'll give them a go and I'll let you know how I get on with them. But I've never actually tried them. So yeah, let me get some and I'll keep you guys posted because a few of you were asking about that. That was the other one. People were saying about um, shopping at uh, Costco and Aldi and places like that. I haven't got a Costco account, but I will get one because quite a few of you were saying that. Why bother shopping at Tesco and stuff when it is cheaper just to go there? Um, thanks. I will look into it. I haven't got a Costco account, but it can't be that hard to get one. I think you probably just go there with a, like a, a business letter, a letterhead, I think. Well, I've got one with Macro, but Costco is literally, there's one just around the corner. So I will, I'll give it a go. We'll do a, we'll do a vlog inside Costco. There are a couple of comments about uh, feeding your staff and wondering whether they'll, you know, sort of end up taking the piss or not. I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. I mean, it's just one of those things, time will tell. I know when they start here, we have a very frank conversation. It's, look, it's give and take, you know. I'll, I'll help you guys out as much as I can, but you've also got to give a little bit, you know. So when it comes to, like, overtime and stuff, generally, as a rule of thumb, I mean, our hours are seven till four. There are lots of times, like, where we'll get to two o'clock and there's just there's not enough time left in the day to book something into that slot so i'm just like all right guys let's just call it a day so they get two hours of you know home time basically but then you know if that happens four or five times that's fine but then if we've got to stay behind you know for you know an hour or so on a job then it's give and take i'm like okay come on help out it's you know that's all it's about so yeah whether the theory works or not i don't know if you ask me in a year i'll i'll give you the answer there's a couple of you were talking about the, um, the new style of content. So we rather than just do 
a job per video, like us working on a house rewire or whatever, or a DB upgrade, whatever. We just do it, I just do it more as a week now. So every video you see is like, it's one week that we've worked and it's just little snippets of everything in the week. Um, quite a few of you seem to like that rather than just doing one job per video. So uh, yeah, I think we'll stick with it because I also prefer doing it and it's, it's, it's actually more, it sounds silly, but it's actually more fun for us to record it. It's just, it's nicer as well. So yeah, I think we'll stick with it. I think it seems to have resonated with quite a few of you. Yeah, that, um, you know, the, Viva the electric Vivaro that I was talking about in my previous video, I'll leave a link to it up here. Uh, quite a few of you were saying that that range thing, maybe he's just caning it or something, and maybe he is because like we, me and the camera guy were talking about this. I mean, maybe he's got the AC on permanently and he's just caning it and maybe, because like to have like 70 miles on a van like that is, he's got to be like proper spank in it because I just can't, like my Kangoo, I can get, if I drive gently, I can get 85 miles out of that. If I drive it gently with a bit of care, care and consideration, and that's only a 22 kilowatt hour battery, and that's got all the rack, the racking in that weighs 200 kilos, plus all the tools in it. I still get, I can still get 80, 85 at a push. So yeah, maybe it was just he's not the most careful employee, the, you know, and he just canes it everywhere. It, it could be, I, I don't know. I've not actually driven one. I'm gonna see if I can find one to go for a test drive in. But yeah, I think a few of you, I think you guys are still on the right track. Maybe he was just driving it without any consideration. Another comment I noticed that was sort of repeatedly coming in. We're not stepping out of domestic work completely. We're always going to be doing that. There's always going to be an element of that in, in my business here. I guess I've done domestic for a long time and I'm just starting to get a bit tired of it. And I'm not getting tired of, I'm not tired of it. I'm tired of the clients that you have to deal with. So with, that's why we're stepping out of it and we're just going more into road and rail because it's just nicer. I'm not saying that doesn't have its own problems. Of course it does. That will have its own unique set of issues that this doesn't. But we're just stepping out of it and what that will enable us to do is be more selective over the domestic clients that we do take on because that, you know, you can then pick and choose the ones you want to take on, which is what we want to do. And that just helps take the squeeze off us a little bit. So it's not we're stepping out of it completely. It's just we're being more selective. Day two. Right, it's the next day. Now, we're back on the case with these vans, trying to get to the bottom. There is some, I don't know if there's an issue with the vans here or not, or whether I'm seeing things that don't exist. That van had a new battery about six months ago. This van had a new battery last week, and now I've tightened up the battery clamp on it, it is okay. But I've got a DC clamp meter. In fact, it was one of those ones I showed you in the content the other day. I've been doing a bit of poking around, trying to get to the bottom of why these batteries are going flat, because it just seems premature. They shouldn't die as early as they do. This van is currently locked. Yeah, so this is locked as if it was just in a state of standby waiting for someone to unlock it. Now this van is currently pulling 350 milliamps. That's on the first cable and then the second cable, 0.25 of an amp. 600 milliamps you're pulling off that battery in standby. And that's everything switched off. All the Sortimo stuff is switched off and it's just literally in standby. This van is exactly the same. It pulls exactly the same figures. It's no different. So it's not that there's a fault with one of the vans. It's just, this is just a generic thing on these vans. But on standby, they pull 600 milliamps. What I want to try and get to the bottom of is, is it the aftermarket electrics or is it just these vans pull that current on every van. With me and the camera guy were talking, we've only noticed this problem when one of these vans is sitting here for a few days. Because before we had the unit, these vans every day were out on the road. And sometimes these vans, one of them is sat here. So we're just trying to work out, is it an issue with the aftermarket electrics or is it just a Renault traffic thing? Again, if this was like 120 amp hour battery like I had in the old Renault, you probably wouldn't even notice it because the battery is so big it can absorb that much current, it's not an issue. But these little 60 amp hour batteries, it's a bit harder. There's one fuse that does all the sort of mo electrics. So let me disconnect that and we'll just see if the current drops. If it doesn't drop, then we know it's nothing to do with any of the aftermarket stuff. When these vans went to Sortimo, all the electrics were basically piggybacked off the fuse box. So they weren't wired, it wasn't wired directly into the vehicle permanently. They're just those little piggyback fuses that you, you basically push in and you can put another fuse on top of it. So the idea is you can just literally unplug it and the vehicle's back to a factory spec. But under here is a little blue, you see that little blue box is basically a battery protection module. And the idea is, is that when the battery voltage gets between, well, I think when it falls below 12 and a half volts, I think it is, or 12.4 volts or something, 
it switches off all of the original stuff so you don't basically so you don't drain the battery actually i'm not sure if it's 12.4 volts i don't know 100 percent whatever the volt there's a cutoff point after that it just disconnects everything that's sort of related so theoretically all i've got to do is just put my clamp meter over this incoming cable you see at the moment that's not pulling anything there's just no pull on that at all so i know it's not anything to do with the sort of wiring it's nothing to do with them yeah i've got a feeling it is just that's just how much these vans pull when, when they're at rest okay so we know it's not the sort of stuff or any of the aftermarket stuff the only other thing it could be is the trackers that are on the van because again they're both the same so i've unplugged the tracker that little device there so bypass the bonnet so we can keep it open while we're working so when you just lock the van i mean that's a lot i mean that's pulling 2.7 amps i mean I'll, that'll go down in a second i guess all right let me give that a few minutes let it settle down and we'll see we'll see if we can get it under half an amp with the tracker removed because that's the only other other thing we've done 20 minutes later the track has made little to no difference there's a very slight difference but we're talking i mean it's a negligible negligible amount that one's pulling 0 0.2, 0 0.25. This van with the tracker still fitted is pulling 0 0.25, 0 0.3. It's not enough that it's worth disconnecting them. So yeah, it is just, that's as far as I can see, it's just a vehicle issue. Not an issue as such, but it's just that's how much this, these vehicles pull in standby, which is weird. Somebody made a point in the comments, quite clever, and I will do it next time these batteries die, which is obviously not going to be long, that's not going to be far away. If you take a charger like that one, if you connect it using crocodile clips or something to the battery cables, if you lift the battery cables off with the charger connected, the vehicle will think it's still got a battery connected to it. I can then take the battery out, put a bigger battery in, reconnect it, and I won't have to use like a laptop or anything to reset the computer because it'll think there's power all the time. Um, so that was quite a clever idea, but obviously, I mean, these have got new batteries now, so I'll, yeah, I'll just wait until these batteries die, but next time they die, I'll definitely do that, and I'll just put a fat battery in, I'll just measure that battery box, and I'll just put the fattest battery I can fit in there. There's actually more content we're going to do on this, on this Friday videos coming, because we're going to go into more detail on battery capacities and stuff, we're going to do some calcs on the boards upstairs, so I'm not going to put that in this video, because some of you might not be interested in that, so that's going to be this Friday's video coming, and we're just gonna do that video purely on you know, lead acid batteries, calcs, amp powers, and all that sort of stuff. So that's gonna be this Friday's video. So make sure, if you're into that sort of stuff, it'll be this Friday that video is gonna come out. Uh, right, we've gotta go back to that job in that garden now where you know we were working there the other day. It was the a single socket water leak full of water. We undid it, water pissed everywhere. That one now, we've gotta put a new bit of pipe in. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do it yet. I'll just take a selection of stuff with me. But uh, let me wash my hands up and we'll see you over there. Mm. Right, okay. This is why you see some people, even though it's a waterproof box, you see them drill like a six mil pilot hole in the bottom deliberately. So if you do get condensation and build up and stuff, it can just drain away. Customer doesn't want to change this one. She wants to keep it in place. So what we'll do, I'll drill a six mil pilot hole in the bottom here so the water can drain out in future. And this fitting here, I can't see water. There's no such thing as a waterproof one of these, but what I'm going to do, I'll strip it apart because these haven't been sold. You can see these haven't been welded together. I'll solve and weld these three pieces together and that should give us a good enough joint. That was a bit camp. All I've done is just taken this out. The problem is in an ideal world, it's one of those things, where do you stop? What I'd like to have done, take all of these out, put a proper plastic junction box here because I hate these metal, these galvanized boxes outside. I'm not a lover of that. It would have been nice to take that out, bottom entry onto that, coupler across into that single socket, coupler across into a few spur, then go bottom entry up to that switch. But I mean, customer doesn't want to go into that much hassle and detail. So we're just going to do this for the time being. This is what I said a lot of the time. It's you're trying to, trying to make things as safe as you can and meet the customer's expectations and you sort of end up meeting halfway. Or well, that's the case in this, this bit here. I mean, I've seen metal junction boxes like this outside. You do see it. It's just, I'm not a lover of it when I see it. I mean, you can put the water, this one's got a waterproof gasket, but I'm just not a lover of it. The solvent cement is brilliant. This is actually a piece we made a second ago, just to demonstrate it. Just two pieces of uh, black plastic 20 mil pipe and a coupler. If you just use solvent cement, because you see, uh, there's, I mean, a lot of companies don't bother using solvent cement so they can take it apart afterwards. But if you know it's a permanent installation, I mean, once it's 
people literally can't separate it once that's the only downside once you've joined them that's it it's a permanent you, you know, if you make a mistake you've got to cut it out and put a new piece in but it is astonishingly strong that's quite strong that's quite a dumb thing to do actually i just i literally did what you just said well i thought just have a sniff and just see what it's like can't describe that smell it's like a i mean it makes you high it's like a not acrid it's like a acidic happy happy on the bath the rubber gasket on this is actually okay because it's holding the water in which means if it's holding the water in it can keep the water out right that's gonna have to be bloody quick that's it that I'd say it's going to be pretty weather tight now. I was initially thinking that the water was coming in through this, going down through this conduit and dripping into here, but it's not. We took this off and that's completely dry in there. So that's it. Yeah, that will now never come apart. Yeah, this does dry out actually. Once you open it, if you come back to that in like six months, there won't be anything left in it. It'll just all have evaporated. Right, try that. If it doesn't work, We'll just have to come back and take these three off and do the whole lot properly. So all we've done, I've just stripped this all apart, put some conduit, uh, some, some cement up here and down here, drilled a hole in the bottom just to allow the water to drain out. Hopefully that'll be enough. If it's not, it's just going to be a question of having to take this off completely and put a new piece of pipe in bottom entry because like I said in my last video, I hate top entry stuff because it is just by default, gravity takes water down. And if you've got bottom entry stuff, at least water can't go up into an accessory. So yeah, I sort of wince when I see top entry stuff outside. I get it, it's easier to install pipe, but it's also, there's an inherent design flaw there, you know? So let's see how they get on with that and I'll update you in the future. Well, if I don't hear anything back, then I'll assume it's working okay. Everybody, right, next day. We are off down to Fulham to go and finish a job, which <laughs> we just can't seem to finish it. Everyone knows. Every time we finish it, the landlord, the, the owner, comes back with more things he wants doing. So we go there, we finish everything, and it's like, can you go back there and just do this? And we just keep going back. It just doesn't end. We were going down there today for our last day, and the guy now wants the 6 mil shower cable changed to a 10. I'm like, it's not going to happen today. So let's get down there. <clears throat> let's pay an extortionate amount of parking. And uh, once we're inside, we'll update you when we get there. Right, we're here. They've done quite a nice job actually, because uh, yeah, actually you guys remember the, how this originally looked. They've done a very nice job. It's all tiled and everything ready for, and they've got a nice new shower tray in. But uh, the powers that be have decided they want to put a bigger shower cable in now. Uh, so rather than just putting an 8.5 kilowatt shower in, they want to put a 10.5 in, but you're going to need a 10 mil cable for that at least. Now we've only got 6 mil here and it's all been very beautifully tiled. I'll try and use the powers of Houdini or something and try and drag. I oh, know, but we're not going to be able to. There's just no way we're going to be able to drag a fat 10 mil behind these tiles. It's just not going to happen, even though this is hollow. So yeah, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. I think the landlord might just have to accept the fact he's just going to have to have a small shower up here. There's just nothing we can do about it. It's very narrow. Like Bog goes there in the corner, but where does the sink go? There's no pipes for it or anything, so I'm not sure. I don't really know where the sinks are. Anyway, it's not my problem, but yeah. They wanted to put a new shower in and we had to drag a 10 mil in, but that's just not going to happen. I can't see how we're going to be able to do that. So uh, we've got to put a mains operated smoke alarm. Up here, he's decided he wants mains operated alarms and there are, there's two downstairs. So we've got to drag an extra three corner up here somehow. Yeah, so whether we go into this cupboard, maybe. Might just do that. I'll just go into this cupboard, clip it at the very back, down into the floorboards and that gets us down to the next floor. New pendant there. Um, I think the decorator had um, a walking plank here, which we can put across and that gets us to there. So we've got to do that. New pendant has to go in. There was an issue with the sockets tripping the RCD, which I'm not too worried about, to be honest, because I've got a feeling, because all the sockets, we left them all screwed on, but someone, the problem is, the day, it's not the decorator's fault, but of course they've got to take them off to nicely sand behind. And like you can see here, they've all been taken off. So I'm quite sure that one of these has probably got a loose earth on it now or something. And that's just what's causing the RCD to trip or neutral earth touching or something. Because there's like 20 odd sockets here and all of them have been taken off. So I've got a feeling if we go around and check, we'll probably find what's causing this RCD issue. He wants an LED strip like we put under here, under this cabinet here. But I'm not really sure how we're going to do that because there's no under cabinet so I'm not really sure I've got a feeling that's just not going to be practical I mean I could clip it under there I guess but I mean we'll see 
I bought the LED strip and a driver pack with me, so we'll see. We might be able to. Oh, he does want a light out here, actually. Yeah. Like a single spot or something. But we can do that from the floorboards upstairs. Okay, let me put some parky on my van before the wardens get a hold of me. All right, let's sort the vans out back in a sec. Tom Snarji, you were witnessed breaking multiple health and safety. Actually, this was a controlled studio environment. I'm actually wearing an invisible harness, you just can't see it. All right. I wonder if James has remembered to bring a pendant from the van. I bet he hasn't. I appreciate this looks like I'm about five miles above the earth at the moment. I'm actually not. Oh, there's a fucking surprise. Two court, no earth. This is what I say about EICRs. You know, you do an EICR, and when you've got remedial work to do, other stuff crops up, you know? There's no earth at that. I mean, technically it doesn't matter because if we put a pendant there, it's double insulated, so it doesn't matter. That is one of the dangers of doing remedial work after an EICR. You end up actually uncovering more stuff that then has to be repaired to put a, a satisfactory ICR on it. So if it's a relatively modern house, it's all right, but when it's an old house like this and there's just loads of, you know, it's just a worn out, tired house, you can, you can end up going down the rabbit hole a lot further than you intended, you know? I remember when I did my NIC assessment, this was years ago. So there's one of those on the ceiling like that. And the guy literally walked up to it. Now obviously you've got your flex coming out there. He walked up to it. You're like, oh, that's access to live parts, that is. I didn't question it at the time. I was like, okay. And he just put it down as an observation thing I had to sort out. But as soon as you remove that without the use of a tool, you've then got access to live parts. But I mean, in a pendant or something, I mean, you've still, you can unscrew that and, all right, the terminals are enclosed to an extent, but I mean, you could still stick your fingers. Do you know what? I didn't know whether he was just like nitpicking or whether there was actually some truth to what he was saying, I don't know. This arrived in the mail the other day, and apparently that is the, from what I gather, the highways approved version of that one. This chicken stick is the one you always see me using. I always, the Q-Stick, Q-Tech Duo, that's the one that I always use, because I like the nulling facility on it. But they are quite temperamental, I've been through about four of those. And this one apparently is the highways one, and I don't know why, that's apparently the one which is recommended. So. I have tried it, but I should probably read the instructions, to be honest. But yeah, FYI for highways, that is the Martindale VT7. Apparently that's the one they recommend. We're running in the, uh, that cable for the undercovered light. There's one covered there that he wants the undercovered lights in. So just uh, running that in now, but <laughs> it's so warm. I think so, yeah. Oh, you are actually recording? All right, no. Apparently this is to stop like mozzies and stuff getting in your face. I mean, it gets in my face. It's really quite irritating. I think I'd rather have mozzies, actually. Yeah, a couple of shrimps on a barbie. It's quite comfy, actually. Is my lack of extreme enthusiasm coming through? Is it filtering through to the camera? I hope it is. Yeah, customers like this, that change their mind and keep adding things. And it's like, what would have been, like, for instance, these, bar these under bathroom lights, these undercovered lights here, right? That was a relatively straightforward job to do when it was asked for, but we put those two in and we didn't bother installing this one under here, but he really wants it. But of course, coming back in like four, six weeks later, lifting everything up and trying to do it, it's just, you know, it would have been infinitely cheaper to have done it at the time. Only took five hours. <laughs> Good value. I'll give you a further example. Don't get me wrong. I really like this client. He's such a nice guy. But I think he's, I think he lives in America, I think and he's just not been here all the time. But there's no light here on this ceiling, in this little, this little landing. And of course he emailed us saying, can we put a light there? And like six weeks ago, when this was all, you know, not plastered and painted, it would have been, you know, it would have been doable. But like now, the only way we're gonna be able to do it, that I can see, is we come off that pendant up there, somehow down the wall here, uh, I don't know, but I think I'm just gonna have to, I'll have to email him and just say, look, do you really want this? Because this is all plastered, it's all freshly plastered and painted now. It's just not, this really is not feasible. You can do it if you want, but it's just, you know, it's our cost and then dev painters and decorators and all of that. <laughs> it's the first time I've laughed all day. This fucking place gives me, honestly, I twitch at night thinking about this place. <laughs> These lights, what do you think of them? But yeah, I mean, it's an acquired taste, I get it. But he wanted, didn't want a pendant, he wanted a decorative light fitting. Now, your, your choice of decorative light fittings that happen to be double insulated, that aren't an LED bulkhead, is really slim. And that was all we could get. I mean, they're quite nice, and it powers off at the moment, I'll show you. But they are, you know, when they're on, they're quite nice. I was just talking to James upstairs, 
And I, I think he's got a valid point because he was just saying he's learned far more doing domestic than doing industrial. He's learned loads more and like with fault finding and stuff. Because like with industrial stuff, it's all armoured. So everything's just on display. You can track stuff easily. But here, I mean, it's just, well, I mean, it took hours to do this. Just, you know, it just takes time. And I think he's got a valid point, you know. He was saying that the main difference between like industrial commercial versus domestic is that, you know, generally, not, it's not 100% true, but generally somebody with half a noggin is, you know, has installed it in commercial industrial. Generally, someone with a bit of noggin has installed it. In domestic, any old fucking schlep can do it, you know? And when it comes to fault finding, that's what makes it so much harder because like, you just don't know what someone's tried to do. It's just such a weird and wonderful way people have done things, even here, you know? And I'll be funny, any, you know, Billy's mate from the pub who knows Vera down at the post office, who knows Sarah, the inbred cousin of the second aunt removed sister, they, their friend did it. <laughs> just, you just don't know. It's just so difficult to wrap your head around some of it, you know? Right, we are calling it a day in there because it is just too hot. All we can do now in there really is that 10 mil shower cable, which I've got to get permission from him to do. And we ain't gonna be able to do that at four o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm gonna call it a day here. So we're gonna head back to the unit. Actually, I tell a lie, before we head back to the unit, there's one thing I wanna show you just down the road. So let me dry my hands and I'll see you down there. Before we go back to the unit, I just wanna show you that, right? That there is Hammersmith Bridge. That has been shut for the last God, year odd? It's been shut a while. Apparently, the story goes, they were doing a, 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 like a, an engineering survey and they found little hairline cracks in the ironwork on those pillars. See the pillars there? Apparently they found hairline cracks in them and because of that, they couldn't use it for general traffic. Now, my understanding is the story goes, they shut it to general traffic and then eventually, a couple of months later, they shut it to the general, just general foot passengers. Now they have actually reopened it to foot passengers. You can see them if you zoom in, you can see them. From my understanding, the government aren't supporting the repair of that bridge. They're just saying, actually, this is Hammersmith and Fulham's bridge. It's their problem. We're not paying for it. Hammersmith and Fulham Council need 163 million pounds, I think it is, to repair that bridge. And that's just to repair it, right? We're not talking about demolishing it and putting a new one in. That's literally just refurbishing it. Or, what they, what they propose is they can do like a quick fix and that's only going to cost 90 million. Third option was to put a secondary footbridge next to it. Isn't it just cheaper just demolish the fucking thing and put a new one in? Is it not cheaper, faster and easier? I get this whole thing about heritage and we've got to, you know, we've got to maintain heritage and these beautiful structures, but when it costs 160 million pounds just to refurbish it and there's no, there's no, I mean, there's no date when that's going to be put back in use. It just makes you wonder, is it actually genuinely worth it when you think, Actually, the co I mean, I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but surely the cost of refurbishing it and then having to refurbish it in another, you know, 15 years or something, surely the cost of that is not worth it. You know, I understand it's a beautiful, I mean, it is a beautiful structure, it's stunning, but is it really worth keeping it shut for that amount of time, that amount of cost, when you could just demolish it and put a good new bridge in, which will last a good hundred years? Do you see what I'm saying? I don't, I just don't see the logic behind it. But if you know more about it, put it below. Oh yeah, incidentally. I'm not, I mean, this is just a, this is a wild hunch here, but the parking in Hammersmith and Fulham has skyrocketed. I mean, just for a day's parking, I think it's almost 60 quid. It's really expensive here. Um, well, obviously, you know, this is just a conspiracy, but <laughs> before that was shut, parking was much cheaper. So, I mean, you could say that, I mean, so I'm holding this up because there's sun demise. You could say that they're just trying, I mean, they're try, I get it, they're trying to claw as much money as they can to try and pay for the repairs for this. It's got to come from somewhere. So it comes from, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Q taxpayer. But it's food for thought, you know? Right, we're back at the unit. James is getting his van ready because he's got an early start. He's on a six o'clock one tomorrow morning. We're down also in Wandsworth tomorrow morning. We're starting early at six as well tomorrow morning. So the next clip you see will us, well, it'll be us. I might be on the Duke tomorrow because I've got an EICR, but I'm not sure. I'm gonna to have to break out the sort of my multi-packs, but I don't know if I can get a test meter in there. I don't know. I might be on the Duke, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, let's find out. Okay, next day. Now, we're doing an EICR again. Uh, we're on our final batch, to be fair. It's the last couple that we were doing. And this is quite an, inter it's quite an interesting one. Sort of makes you smile when you see it, you know. This was an old Wilex board. Still serviceable, nothing wrong with them. But we've got a Wilex main switch. But what I quite like is this was a dual RCD board. And at some point, Someone's taken out the RCD and fitted a main switch. Now, that would tell me there is a, there's a tripping issue somewhere 
on those circuits. That would be my guess. What I might do actually, just for the sake of looking, I'm going to take that RCD. And in fact, I've got another Wilex one in the van. I'll just pop it in and just see whether we've got a tripping issue. I'd be almost certain if someone's taken the RCD and put a main switch in, they've done it to cover up an issue. So I haven't tested any of these circuits yet. I'm just writing out all the details now, but uh, we'll see when I get to it. Right, as suspected, we do have an issue, which is why the RCD has been taken out. Bless their cotton socks. I'd like to know when it was done, but you're never gonna get to the bottom of that information. What I like to do is keep the neutrals in the bar, turn all the breakers off, just test one circuit and turn the main switch off and that way, you, there's no back feed, so you can test between neutral to earth and stuff. But yeah, there's a dead short between live and earth. 0.4 of an ohm. So that is, yeah, there is an issue there somewhere. And between neutral and earth, we also have 0.4. So yeah, there is an issue of some sort. I can't tell you the whole story, um, just privacy. Um, but they've had, they've got two bathrooms in this house. And we're not talking big bathrooms. We're talking from that pillar. I don't know if you can see it, making out that pillar there, um, across. So it's not actually smaller than this, smaller than this little space, not big. Two bathrooms that size. We had them refurbished, 51,000 pounds. Yeah, 51,000 pounds have two bathrooms refurbished. So someone saw them coming, unfortunately. That's the day and age we live in, unfortunately. They haven't paid all of it. I mean, it's very difficult now because they've accepted the price and stuff to now try and argue it now. It's very hard. I do feel for them, I really do, because that's, you know, they've been robbed properly of money. Have we got 0 0.80 on the live? It's 0.79. Excellent. All right, so we've got continuity. That's the main thing. There's leakage somewhere, which would explain why someone fitted a main switch. I think I've mentioned this in previous content. When you're doing tests on fuse boards, sometimes it isn't practical to turn off. Like here, it's lovely. I can just turn off the main switch and I can just do everything. You've got no fear of, you know, yes, the, the, term, the main switch is still live, but the rest of the board is dead. And sometimes it's just not practical when you're trying to do an EICR, especially now when customers are home, they're working from home on Zoom calls and stuff. It's not practical to turn everything off. They want the power to stay on. And that's just something we have to work around in this day and age. I know the book says you're supposed to turn everything off, but sometimes in reality, it's just not, it just isn't practical. But anyway, the point of this was, I've mentioned this in previous content, just be careful of back feeds on circuits. So I had it on a job the other day. Uh, we had two lighting circuits like that. And then I turned one off and I couldn't see what it was powering. I just couldn't, it, everything stayed on. So, after about 10 minutes of faffing around, I just couldn't find, I kept switching on and off, couldn't see what it was turning off. So in the end, I just put it down on ticket, cannot locate circuit. So I put down the brake of the type and type of cable and stuff, but I just put can't locate, you know, which is reasonable. You can't, you know, you can't find every circuit. Got to the ne next one, tried turning that one off. Same, I couldn't find it. I was like, okay, can't locate. And eventually I went back to it later on and I, had to I turned off the RCD. And when the RCD tripped, all the lights went off. I was like, hang on a minute. Turns out you've got a back feed. So one circuit is powering that circuit and that power circuit, they power each other. So to turn off, it was kitchen lights. To turn off the kitchen lights, both breakers have to be off. So I'm just saying, be careful when you're, just because you turn off a breaker, don't assume that when you take the cable out the top of the, the breaker that it will be dead because it was actually still being powered by that breaker, which wasn't right, that's C2. But just something to be aware of, you know, um, because it is, don't ever assume just because you turn the breaker off that it's dead, because there are many instances where it will still be live. I was just talking to the camera guy just a minute ago, just about um, the, how these readings will fluctuate. Generally, they stay relatively stable, but they will fluctuate depending on how much the circuit is loaded, how much you've been using it before you test it, the temperature, how well, you know, from testing it one day to the, you know, if I come back in 30 days time, where your meter may be slightly out of calibration. So the results you get um, will fluctuate. If one person goes in and tests it and then somebody else goes in, you sh it's very unlikely you'll get exactly the same readings. They do fluctuate slightly, but it should give you a good gauge. But we were just talking about, um, RCDs. I had a job down in Hoburn. It was like a good two years ago now. They were complaining that the RCD was tripping randomly on the sockets in that room and they couldn't work out why. And I couldn't work out why. I was pulling my hair out trying to get to the bottom of this, this issue because I just couldn't figure it out. It would just trip randomly. 
I did an RCD test, did a drop, you know, all these things are trying to figure it out. Did a half load test, did, you know, so many weird and wonderful things and we just, I could not get to the bottom of it. And eventually, by chance, the power was on and I was standing outside the room, the manager there, she closed the door, it was a big heavy door. She closed the door and every time when she, and I, we were standing outside, she closed the door and the RCD tripped just by chance, I could hear it. I was like, ooh. So I reset it and I said, like, do that again. She closed the door, tripped. No one had made the connection. I hadn't, I just hadn't noticed it. That every time this big door, this big heavy, this big heavy metal door, every time it shut, it would trip the RCD. And we worked out that there was a little window in this room. Every, whenever the window was open, you could open and close the door fine. As soon as you close that window, it used to be a bank, so I think these were like airtight windows. They were really, really, they were very well sealed windows. Every time you shut the window and you close the door, the air pressure rose in the room. Only for a second, you know, when it pops your ears, it was enough that it tripped the RCD because the fuse board was in the same room. Um, so yeah, things like air pressure, pressure variances can cause RCDs to trip, it does happen. I think maybe they're a little more resilient now. That was, it was actually, it was an old Wilex like this one. But yeah, something to look out for. See, sometimes you'll go looking for really complex problems and that one would, I, I just, that would have taken, if that hadn't happened, we'd, I wouldn't have got to the bottom of the fault. So yeah, air pressure and stuff does cause RCDs to trip. So just out of curiosity, I thought just to scratch the old curiosity itch. I swapped these around, so I've put the main switch on this side, I put the RCD this side, and lo and behold, <laughs> you know that instinct that you get when you see that, when you see someone's put a main switch there? Yeah, there's a fault. The insulation values are testing out okay. So like, I'll give you an example. I've done the ends to ends, they're all okay. Insulation testing on the first one, which was this one, was really poor, I've got half a mega ohm on that one. But it does still hold. The second one, I actually got quite good insulation values on that one. That one got 52 mega ohms, which makes it trip. But I think that's just the start, the st starting up because yeah, now it holds. But you've got to you've got to click it a few times to get it to hold. So, but I did do the testing, and it's you have got rings there. The insulation values were all passable. So, I've got a feeling that is something that's plugged into the circuit because I haven't unplugged anything. But as soon as you turn the lighting circuit on, it trips. I can see why somebody else was like, sod this, and they just swapped them around. Not that I'm saying that's acceptable. <laughs> so just hold the microphone like this. We're setting up for our motor vlog. Ah, oh, when's this video coming out? This video is coming out. This is going to be Monday's video. Oh, in that case, you've already seen the motor vlog. We're setting up for it now. Uh, but that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, links are all coming up on the screen here now. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you on Friday's video.